we as the human species are heading for genetic death. Mutations are not creating us, they're destroying us. Time is the enemy of evolution. It doesn't save the problem. So the answer is it's going the wrong way. It's going the wrong way. The only way you get information, specified complexity, is from intelligence. The only intelligence that's possible is God. Don, you've had a full-time career as an experimental biologist. Natural selection is taught in high school as evolution. You say this is incorrect. Can you tell me why? Yeah, it's true. But, um, many textbooks just teach ev evolution is natural selection or natural selection is evolution. But um, even some prominent evolutionary biologists actually say this is wrong. And Dr. John Endler, he's famous for the research on guppies and, and their adaptations. And I'll read what he says uh, to make sure I get it exactly right. He says, natural selection must not be equated with evolution, though the two are intimately related. And he goes on to say, natural selection does not explain the origin of new variants, only the process of changes in their frequency. So evolution has to explain the origin of brand new features, such as feathers where they weren't before, muscles where they weren't before, and that sort of thing. And natural selection does not create anything. So to say natural selection is the same as evolution is quite misleading. But we're told a lot that this is natural selection. This is what natural selection's done, and it is an evidence for evolution. So what's happening there? Well, there, there are lots of examples of natural selection, and, but none of them create any new features. Um, natural selection can favour a creature which has features which help it to reproduce and produce more offspring, and then its features then passed on to more offspring and they propagate through the population. And this is what natural selection does. But it doesn't explain the origin of the features. The only thing that explains that is mutation. So they're actually leaving this out. Mutations, the only game in town. So what are mutations? They're accidental mistakes in copying the information from one generation to the next. Mistakes in the genes, the genetic information. And that's the only mechanism they have to create new features. And I think the reason they don't talk about it much, almost nothing in many of the textbooks, is that they recognise that students will see that mutations aren't up to the job. So they just, just downplay mutations and talk about natural selection. So natural selection is a real process. It does things, but it doesn't produce the type of change needed for evolution. That's correct. And you're saying it's mutations that is the thing that's relied on to, yeah. to make evolution happening. That, that's the modern evolutionary theory. It's called neo-Darwinism or the modern synthesis. And this has been since the 1920s, and it's still the theory of evolution. But the way it's taught today, they've virtually dropped mutations. They just talk about natural selection. So why can't mutations do it? Why can't mutations produce the type of change that we need for evolution? Yeah, mutations are random changes. So basically you've got these specifications in the DNA that say how to make incredible things like motors and linear motors and rotary motors and all sorts of amazing contraptions are specified in the DNA. And so these instructions... It's like a massive computer program. And the, the mutations are accidental changes in that information. So can you imagine throwing some accidental changes into a computer program and expect it to actually become a more complex computer program? That's what, that's what the problem with mutations is, and that's why they're being downplayed. Because if you go back uh, many years ago, when mutations were discovered, they said, oh, this is the mechanism for evolution to find new information. And then they embarked on this massive program of a mutation breeding of fruit flies. So they zapped fruit flies with irradiation, like gamma rays, to make them mutate, thinking they'd make them into super flies. And it never happened. They just created defective flies. And then they've, they've done it with crops and things and mutation breeding at crops. And all you get is defective things. Sometimes defective things can be useful. Like, for example, a dwarf wheat can be better than a, a tall wheat because it doesn't fall over. But you've still broken something to do that. So it, it, they've never found a mutation which actually adds a new gene or adds new information to, to make evolution believable. So all this has gone cold, the whole idea of zapping things with gamma rays and making them mutate and making them into superbugs and things. 
they recognise it doesn't work. So now they're teaching evolution as if mutations are really well. We do, we, 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 yeah, mutations happen, but you know it's all about natural selection. Mm. That's what they go, they're doing. And why do they do that? Because I think that most students would recognise that mutations just don't cut it to explain the information. But what about, Don, with mutations? I know there can be deletions within the DNA, but then I've heard people say, well, there's also um, insertions. So there you go. You've got some new information. You've got an insertion in the DNA. You've got more letters of DNA. Therefore, there's more information. Um, could that not work? Could that not help evolution? Well, you can get letters inserted, but it's like, like our computer program. Insert a letter. Is that going to make the computer program into something better? No, it actually wrecks it. And that's what you find these things do. Insertions, deletions, uh, none of them create a new gene. See, uh, humans, for example, have over 130 different gene families, and, and gene families are entirely different structured genes. So you can't take a, a, a gene from this gene family and make a few little changes to it and make it into an entirely different gene. They are so different that you've got to have massive change. And so just inserting a letter here or inserting a letter there, deleting a letter here, just doesn't do it. So it doesn't, doesn't work. Mm, got you. So you can insert more information, but it's not the type of information well, that's needed. the information, th th this is a misused concept because you can illustrate it this way. So this st stuff called Shannon information. So many years ago, this guy by the name of Shannon did a lot of stuff on uh, trying to work out how many bits it would take to transmit um, a bit of a string of data, you know. So basically, if you're going to send it over a wire or transmit it or store it, uh, how many bits would it take? And so he worked out and very cleverly worked out, given something, how many bits would be the minimum you could actually send this or store it or whatever. So it's called Shannon information. Mm. But it's got nothing to do with the information content in a book or a piece of writing or something like that. Because if you think about it, uh, take, so for example, um, she has a, an automobile. She has an automobile, right? That sentence. Sentence, 21 yeah. letters. Okay. Take another, another sentence. Sue has a red Porsche. Same number of letters. More information. Same information for, as far as Shannon's concerned. Oh, I see. But Sue has a red Porsche, tells you the name of the person, the fact, the colour of it, and the type of type of vehicle, which was missing in the first sentence, was which was she has an automobile or she has a, an automobile. So the first sentence has less information than the second sentence, but it has the same Shannon information. And you're saying the same applies to the DNA. The same applies to the DNA. So it's not good just adding a letter or throwing in. That, that's more Shannon information, but it's not more specifications that actually specify how to make a new machine or a new biochemical pathway or, any, or a new enzyme or something. It just doesn't, it doesn't cut it. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great example. So, so mutations randomise the information. So in that sense, they increase Shannon information, but, but they destroy the information because they're upsetting these precise instructions for how to make the machines and things inside living cells. Is there a name, just so it's useful when we're talking about it, we've got Shannon information is this one type of information, and then is it useful yeah, information? It's, it's useful? Actually, what do you call it? Useful information, yeah. they call it specified complexity. Specified complexity. That's a technical term. Okay. But you specify something complex uh, that functions, has a function that has, you know. So what evolution needs to do is find specified information. That's right. And it, there's no mechanism yeah, for that. Yeah, how to make a new enzyme, how to make a new pathway, how to make a new protein, how mm. to make pr uh, muscles where they weren't there before, mm. yeah, how to make an eye. You know, all these things, that has to be explained. Yeah, okay. So I want to get on to some of this, and I want to ask you a question about superbugs because you mentioned that. But first of all, can I just ask you, you mentioned also the modern synthesis, just so that's clear. Does that mean, so Darwin, we all, we all heard of Darwin, Charles Darwin, the origin of species, 1859, but the modern synthesis came later. And did that, was that the thing that added mutations yes. to natural selection? So yeah. Darwin said natural selection? No, Darwin was just natural selection. Right. So, and these modernists are coming back, just going back to Darwin, like, like there's nothing happened in the last, you know, since Darwin. Yes. And they go back to Darwin. Oh, it's just nat muta mut natural selection is, is evolution. That's what Darwin said. Yes. But they realised in the early 1900s that that didn't cut it. 
because uh, you needed some source of new information, new genes. Hence mutations, but we're saying that doesn't even cut it. Yeah, they now, now, now know that that doesn't cut it. I know. I've even seen admissions uh, from many secular mm-hmm. biologists saying that, especially uh, I think it was 10 years ago they had a meeting and they said, look, the, um, this isn't working. The modern synthesis isn't working. We need something new. That's correct. Okay, Don, so superbugs, um, we talked about them. Now, isn't that an, isn't that an example of increased information? They're superbugs. They're, they're better than the bugs before. And we see them in hospitals. They cause havoc. Like what's, well, what's this, happening Well, this is exactly the way they confuse these things because uh, the so-called superbugs, what, what's happened? So, for example, a typical example is uh, the antibiotics taken up through a channel in the cell membrane or cell wall of, of the bacterium, and that channel specified on the DNA. It's very complex, and that channel normally takes up food, but it happens to take up the antibiotic as well. So that's how it gets into the cell. So then it kills the um, the cell, and it dies, and it loses that information. But if there's one with a mutation which actually modifies the channel a bit so that it's not as effective at taking up its food. It also doesn't take up the antibiotic, so oh. it's resistant to the antibiotic. But that doesn't sound good if it can't take food in. No, it can't take its food up as well either because it's modified the channel and it can't take up the antibiotic, but it can't take up its food as well. But it's resistant to the antibiotic. So then that multiplies as natural, well, as artificial selection in a sense, but it's natural selection happening that the ones with the resistance multiply in the hospital where you've got the antibiotic being used. Uh, and they multiply up. This is natural selection. Uh, So you're eliminating the ones that don't have the mutation, right? But you're not adding a new gene. You're just modifying an existing one and actually making it detrimental to the survival of the bacterium when it's away from the antibiotic. So you go out of the hospital... Uh, into the outside world where the antibiotic's not being used. It's got used. to compete with the other bugs. It's got to compete with the normal bugs that don't have the mutation. And they can eat better. And they can eat better and, and they survive better. Natural yeah. selection works in the opposite direction mm. uh, and favours the one that's not mutated. Mm. So, you know, this is breaking something. In every case, a dozen and dozens of examples of antibiotic resistance have been studied at the molecular level and in every case you break something. You're not right. adding something. Now, there's other mm. cases where you can borrow the information from another bacterium that already has it, but that doesn't explain the origin of it. <laughs> so, mm. Oh, is this when the uh, some of these singular cellular organisms can transfer DNA? I forgot what it's called. Yeah, there's, it, it, there's little loops of um, DNA called plasmids, and they form a little tube between them called conjugation, yes. and, uh, and they can sh- pass these loops between one another, and so they can share their antibiotic resistance when it's on that loop. Yeah, I guess they're sharing their created <laughs> DNA, we would argue. That's so, right, yeah. So it's not really a, it's not a case of some new information coming yeah. from. So if anything should should mutate and, and evolve, it should be bacteria because there's so many of them and they've got a short generation time and they can sustain a high mutation rate. So all these three things are supposed to be the stuff of evolution so if you're going to see anything mutate, anything be- evolve, it should be bacteria. And you don't, you don't see them become something else. I mean, there's bacteria identified in the 1800s, 1850s and so on. They've been named then. And, f- and as far as we can tell, they're just the same today. Wow. Well, there's slight differences, but they're, they're recognisably the same yeah. species. You know? so, and you think, that's how many generations and so on. That, that, there should have been some evolution. It should have changed into something else by then, but they don't because – the mechanism is not there to do it. Yeah, I always think that would be the nail in the coffin. If they really wanted to show us that evolution was true, well, give us an example. Mm. Um, it makes me think of the long-term evolution experiment. Oh, yeah, Are you yeah, familiar yeah. Lensky, with that one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. In the United States. So he's uh, been through like... I think it's oh, over 70,000 generations. It's, it's been handed on to somebody else now, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, over 70,000 generations of E. coli and yeah. all they've got is one little minor <laughs> yeah. adaptation to... To feeding on uh, on citrate, you know, so the thing. There's uh, still bacteria. This is still E. coli and oh, um, oh, E. coli, yeah. Yeah, it's still, it's still E. coli, and and all that's happened is normally E. coli can't feed on citrate. Uh, well, they can, but they they basically turn on the gene to to feed on citrate. But in the presence of oxygen, they don't feed on fit citrate citrate because it's inefficient. Yeah. So um, so what happened was they they the mutation turned off. Um, the, it's sort of suppression of citrate utilisation. 
Wow, so it's kind of like similar to what you're saying with the superbugs. It's, yeah, we say it's, it's a defect which in a certain mm. circumstances is you know, beneficial. Yeah, so cer- it's certain circumstances. These mutations can be beneficial in that certain environment. But if you put them back in their natural environment where they've got to compete with their ancestors, yeah. in a way, they're not going to gonna be out-competed. So That's it's right. not – you're saying it's not really advantageous. No, is that what well, you're saying? it's advantageous to their survival at, at, at those time. conditions, but yeah. it's not an upward progression that they're going to go to something else, some higher organism or something. This is the point. Yep. You need a mechanism to generate new genes, new information. Specified. S- specified information yep. for new genes, new enzymes, new proteins, new functions that weren't there before. Feathers on reptiles, you know – uh, muscles and things that didn't have them, put eyes and things that didn't have them, and, and mutations don't cut it. Don, I'm glad we've got to cover a few of these examples like um, citrate uptake in E. coli and superbugs because they're often pushed as these are advances in evolution. Um, so I think it's great we've covered that. Now, I just want to bring us back to natural selection because we're saying, okay, it's mutation needs to be the driver, but why natural selection is sometimes pushed on its own as evolution? And I guess that's Darwin's original theory. Um, but what you've said is it doesn't appear to do anything um, to progress a creature to a more advanced form. So what's happening here? Why are we being told that natural selection can progress a creature to a more advanced form? Um, I, I think it relates to the uh, use of evolution as a materialistic indoctrination. And, you know, if, if this was an, just an honest presentation of information, you know, to educate people, then I don't think they'd be holding back that mutations don't, don't cut it. So they're holding holding off on the on the mutation side of things because they know that people won't believe it if they really know what evolution's about. So this examples of natural selection are so obvious. So here's natural here's an example of natural selection. You know, oh, there you are. There's evolution. Oh, okay, that's evolution. Mm. That's pretty obvious. You know, must be true. Mm. And so they're hoodwinking people into believing. Can, can you it. give us some of these examples? So Darwin's finches. They've got all these different shaped beaks, which mm. are d- adapted to different sorts of food and. Uh, some are good at probing into flowers and getting insects. Other ones are good at rack- cracking hard seeds. And so with the availability of food varying, depending on the seasons, whether it's a wet season or a drought or whatever, certain beaks are going to be better adapted to survival. So those finches with those beaks are going to come up, go up and down in population. So natural selection is operating here. Yep. No, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with adaptation, natural selection, speciation. I don't have a problem with the story. But they're still finches. Mm. They haven't changed into something else. And this is the trickery of it. You, know, you think about those finches and the variety in those finches is much less than you see in the variety of dog breeds we have today. And they've been bred in the last couple of hundred years, most of them. So, you know, look at the dog breeds and the variety and say, well, the variety in the finches is much less than that. And yet they give them different species names. So they're not even real species. They have interbreed together and everything. So how does that prove, how does the variation in finches, variation within a created kind, I would say, mm-hmm. h- how does that prove that worms change into finches over 300 million years, which is what evolution is supposed to claim? Mm, but it doesn't. But what you're saying is the reason they don't talk about, people are not talking about mutations, they're talking about natural selection is because at least you can see it now. Yeah, you can see it. You can see it. And it's obvious, mm. you know, but so therefore evolution's obvious. Mm. No, it's not. Well, I get told, Don, just give me enough time. You know, the Earth's been around a long time. I've I've spoke to people even recently, and they've said this to me: just, well, just give me more time, and we'll, you know, the natural selection will carry on, and we'll go from um, one kind of animal to another kind of animal. Yeah. Well, they say it's in the fossils, but it isn't. But when we look at these mutations, they're actually destroying us. They're not creating us. For yeah. example, uh, we have humans have now we know that 100 new mutations per child. So every generation gets 100 new mutations. And these are accidental changes to the 3,000 million chemical letters on our DNA. So on average, they don't do a lot. There's not a huge, usually they're not lethal. But on average, a mutation in 3 billion letters is going to have a tiny effect, Mm. but a tiny detrimental effect because it's a random change. And so natural selection can't get rid of these mutations. If you had, first of all, natural selection can't see them. They're too small effect. So it's like rust on your car. So every little rust spot in your car, the rust won't stop your car working, 
So but, we're still surviving. But eventually all the rust spots will join up and then your car will fall apart. Yeah, so you're had, saying we as the human species are heading for well, genetic death. We're he heading for genetic we're, Genetic Decline. decay is destroying us, not making us. Mm. And so time is the enemy of evolution. It doesn't save the problem. So so the answer is it's going the wrong way. We're going the wrong way. Right. Going the wrong way. Going backwards. Not a, so, you know, the um, – Russian geneticist uh, Alexei Kondrashov said, no, he's just an evolutionist, he said, why aren't we dead 100 times over? Looking at these mutations in humans, why aren't we dead 100 times over? Now, he's thinking about a time frame of a million years for humankind, and so he's got this concept in his head, so he's thinking about with a million years, should, surely we should be extinct already. Mm. But, of course, if we've only been here for a few thousand years, I mean, it makes sense that we're not extinct yet. But we're heading for extinction. So mutations are not creating us. They're destroying us. Why is this not information not widely known? I mean, do, do these – is it population geneticists that would be aware of this? Oh, yeah. yeah po well, Condrachol's a population geneticist and, he, and there's many others. And, yeah. and, uh, and they write about this and they talk about it. But it's, it don't expect to find it in the textbooks that they use in schools and universities to – basically to convince students that evolution happens. Do they have a way around it, Don? Because it seems like, well, if experimentally we can show that we're adding 100 new mutations per generation to the human genome, surely that puts evolution dead in the water. They must, they yeah. must have some kind of workaround. Like, do they? No, yeah. there's no workaround. Oh. It is dead in the water. Okay. <laughs> wow. Don, thinking about this makes me think I'm glad that Jesus is coming back soon. I because I rec I'd guess that he is coming back before we're going to go extinct. Would that be your thought I, too? I, ex I expect that's the plan, yes. <laughs> yeah, cuz although um if we've had it and I, again I guess this fits in with the age of the earth according to the Bible because that's true. um I, I know you did mention that but if it was because it's a shorter time we've not gone extinct yet and we don't think it's going to be much longer in the future. I mean, we've been here 6,000 years. We're probably not going to be here another 6,000 years. And Jesus is going to come back sooner. So therefore, um, this isn't as big an issue for a Christian That's as a non-Christian. Because we, we yeah. have a hope of where and we're as, going. As, as a flip side of this too, that if we're getting 100 new mutations each generation, it points back to less in the past. It points back to perfection in the past when God made Adam fresh from the dust he didn't have mutations. He didn't have any defects in his DNA. So we're on this slide away from the perfection that was there in the beginning. And why? Because of sin. Because sin brought death and suffering into the world. And uh, that's what that's what happened with Adam. So Adam would have had a perfect genome yeah. without any mutations. That's right. And it's the result of the curse that mutations have even come about. Yeah. God, God withdrew some of his sustaining power from the mm. creation at that point. He said, if you don't want me to rule over you, well, okay, let's see what happens. <laughs> Don, could this be a reason why we see these long ages in the Bible at the beginning? You know, Adam, I think he lived over 900 years. And, you know, you've got these people that lived yeah. 900, 800, 600 years. And then, it, and then we get this decline t today yeah. where we're... Well, we don't live that long. <laughs> yeah, well, there's other things too, like, um, you know, in the beginning, brothers and sisters could marry. So people often ask, you know, oh, come on now, you know, Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. Where do all the people come from? You can't have incest, you know. But in the beginning, uh, there was not a problem because people didn't have these mutations. And then, you know, Abraham married his half-sister without, without, with God's blessing. Mm -hmm. But then down the track, Moses is told by God, no, brothers and sisters can't marry. That's not on, you know, so stop, stop that. And why? Well, we can see it today that the genetic decay uh, would be a major reason why. And, of course, God knew that, whereas Moses wouldn't have known it. Yeah, so back then uh, our genomes were in a better condition and therefore if you married a close relative, then it, it's less likely that your kids would have genetic defects. That's right. But go on today and yeah. we've got, we've got um, that problem. And most countries today don't allow first cousin marriages yes. know, because it's, it's dangerous for the offspring. And that would again be a, a process in history where, you know, 400 years ago there would be a lot of countries would allow first cousin marriages. Well, some countries still allow it, but it's not a good idea. Yeah, yeah, no, we won't recommend that. <laughs> no. Um, okay, yeah, this has been good, Don. So we said that mutations are not often talked about because they can't make it happen. Uh, they actually go in the wrong direction. We said natural selection um, is the thing that's talked about because you can see real changes, but they're extrapolating too much. Um, I'm just wondering, before we move on to our next section, is 
is there a hard limit of natural selection? Like, can we say, look, you know, this isn't de- this is definitely not going to go from one kind of an anim- animal to another kind of animal because we can see a hard limit. Uh, well, the big thing about natural selection is that it's it it gets rid of information out of the population. So it's it's okay, it, to, yeah. it, it just does it does not do anything which is going to progress something from less complex to more complex uh, without mutations. Natural selection it just gets rid of information. Yeah, and that's the opposite to the evolution. Which story. is the opposite of what they need. Yeah, you've got to go from the basic symbol, sing, single-celled organism all the way to a human. Yeah, so and, you, you just think about. Um, Wolves, for example, with long hair, you would think, well, they're adapted to cold conditions, but ones with short hair, if you've got ice, icy conditions, the ones with short hair could be killed off by the cold. But what happens is that natural selection has got rid of the genes for short hair. It's a loss of information. It's a loss of information. Mm-hmm. So it's exactly the opposite of what evolution needs. So natural selection actually does the wrong thing. You need mutations, and mutations are being downplayed. And, and it takes it the wrong way. And mutations do the wrong thing. So natural selection does the wrong thing. Mutations do the wrong thing. Evolution is an impossible process. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it's coming together. No. <laughs> um, so I've got another question here, Don. I wonder if we've already covered this. Uh, I've got, doesn't natural selection help evolution by culling the bad mutations, just leaving the good ones? Yeah, it does that much. Uh, if you've got some serious defect um, and you don't manage to reproduce, then that genetic defect is lost from the population. That's natural selection. So again, natural selection is a culling thing. It gets rid of things. Now, before Darwin, creationist biologists recognised that natural selection, they might not call it natural selection, but they recognised that this was a conservative thing that actually sort of helped populations to remain healthy. And so it was seen as a conservative thing. Uh, and then Darwin tried to make it into a creative thing. Right. So he twisted it around and said, oh, no, we can change one thing into another rather than conserving what's there and keeping the health of the population. Uh, he tried to make it into a, into a creative thing, but it doesn't work. Okay, so that still stands. It is a conservative thing because yeah. if, um, if, if someone has a certain or a a person or an animal in a population or plant in a population has um, a certain genome that is defective, then that's not going to survive. Therefore, the population can continue to exist. Yeah, so it doesn't pass on the bad genes to the next pop- the next generation. Yeah. Okay. Don, we've been talking about the failure of natural selection and mutations to produce uh, more complex creatures. And we mentioned near the start that actually people are, the biologists are realizing this now, and um, I've got a, I've got a short quote from a, a Guardian article that summarized what was going on in, in uh, the biological research community, just ten years ago after eight scientists um, published an article, a leading article in the, in the study in the journal Nature, and they said they asked the question, does evolutionary theory need a rethink, and their, their answer was yes, urgently. Uh, But this is the quote from the Guardian article. There are certain core evolutionary principles that no scientist seriously questions. Everyone agrees that natural selection plays a role, as does mutation and random chance. But how exactly these processes interact and whether other forces might also be at work has become the subject of a bitter dispute. If we cannot explain things with the tools that we have right now, the Yale University biologist Gunter Wagner told me, we must find new ways of explaining. So that's where they're at, Don. They yeah. need to find new ways of explaining. Have you got any suggestions for them? Uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, so bring this home for us, Don. What's, what's the answer? Like, what do they need to know? I mean, they, they want to do biology, which you would, I'm saying you'd say is commend is a good thing. They're finding out the way that God's made things. God's encouraged us to do science. But, but what do they really need to know in their heart as well as their mind? Well, there's a recognition there that natural selection and mutations really don't explain what they're trying to explain. And so they're scr- scrabbling around trying to find something better. But the, what else have they got? Um, you've got the genetic information in living things. How can it change? How can you add new code? Because if you're going to write a computer program or add a, add a new part to a computer program, how do you do that? You need to have apply intelligence. 
the only way you get information, specified complexity, is from intelligence. Mm. They don't want intelligence because the only intelligence that's possible is God. So they're trying to work out how we can explain all this information and increased information, living things, without God. And that's where they're, th they're going to come unstuck because you can't do it. Mm. Uh, you can't do it. There has to be intelligent input to create the new code, the new information. I mean, no scientist could ever dream of creating even one of the enzymes that is in a living cell. And they come along after the event and understand you know, how they work maybe uh, but and the structure of it. But to actually go from scratch and say, I'm going to design an enzyme that does this, no, not possible. And so and then they're saying, oh, but all life made itself. It's just so irrational. So these very clever people can be very irrational because they actually don't want to believe in a creator. Yeah, it sounds like they could almost be working against God if they're trying to find a naturalistic explanation yeah. for something God has clearly put it there to tell us yeah. that he's there. And I'm thinking of Romans 1, Don, where it says well, God has yeah. revealed. Is Ra Romans chapter 1 is so clear that the attributes of God are seen in his creation. Exactly, yeah. And so people have no excuse. And I think the people who have the least excuse on this are molecular biologists, people actually studying the things we've been talking about, the amazing complexity and design in living things at all levels. Even the simplest bacterium is amazingly complex and amazingly intricately designed. And so I think the people have the least excuse for the people who are studying this stuff. Yeah. And just so that we have a bit of compassion on any molecular biologists out there, uh, often we get trained in this way of thinking yeah. and you have to produce the paper in this way. But would you encourage them, Don, just stand back from your study and have a look at it and think about it how did that information get there? I yeah. mean, would you encourage them in yeah, that kind yeah, of way? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really, really stand back and look at it and say, did this stuff really come about by, you know, millions of years of mutations and natural selection? It just doesn't add up. And what you'd say is, this is God speaking to you. Yeah, that's right. That yeah. This is information. Mm. It can't come about by random process. It can't come about around by naturalistic means. It points to a supernatural. It points to a designer, as you it were saying. It points to a supernatural designer, yeah. Supernatural designer. So yeah. the whole of creation is telling us God's there. God it's, made it's it. It's shouting at us. God created everything. It's yeah. really shouting very loud, you know, that God created things. It didn't just happen. Yes. And I think this is great that we can tell our young people, go Go and study, go and study nature, go and study science, go and find out the way God's done things because you're going to find that it's shouting about design. That's right, exactly. So people might want to know, where can I get more information? Yes. Um, you can go to creation.com, just look up natural selection. Excellent. And you'll find lots of articles and videos and things about natural selection and explaining why it doesn't really add up for evolution. Brilliant, so that's creation.com. Yeah. Thanks, Don. Thanks a lot for your time today. Yeah, thanks, Scott.